All right. Uh, first of all, let me thank Nathan and everybody who came here. It's my first time in Ireland and I love it so far. It's uh, So I'm really glad that so many people came here to hear me talk into the oldest university in Ireland, if I'm not mistaken. So um, <clears throat> on this Cosmovis project, I joined only in April last year. So what I'm going to present today uh, is something new and something very raw and uh, very open-ended, let's say, uh, because it a little bit differs uh, from my previous uh, research endeavors, but nevertheless, it's related as well. So the title of the talk is Science Scared the Ghosts and Spirits Away, Mountain Worship, Catastrophe Prevention and Environmental Protection Among the Nosui of Liangshan. So on the first side, you already see that there are few uh seeming contradictions uh, so uh like science and ghosts and spirits and uh, like uh, mountain worship and environmental protection and so on so i will first begin from mm, the bigger concepts and then get more to the particular namely the nosui liangshan and their uh cultural practices uh here i'm gonna be really simplistic uh but i have to first talk a little bit about uh, what I mean by science in this talk, uh, or what is the nature of science in the last, let's say, 100 or 150 years in China, because it's very important um, uh, for uh, the uh, explanation of some phenomena in Liangshan. So the science as we know it from the Western notion was imported into China in the late Qing dynasty, uh, there were, this is going to be very simplistic, but there were periods or persons in particular who were really radical about uh, westernization of China, let's say. So they said that the Chinese concepts are obsolete and should be replaced by the Western ones. But what actually happened over the course of the time was that the science was not transplanted to China, but it was rather indigenized in China, meaning the local categories merged with those imported ones and created actually something new. Um, of course, when we talk about science, and it's not only uh, in China, it's worldwide, but this is the global narrative of science. Science is always uh, connected <laughs> to the notion of modernization uh, and especially rationalism. So. Uh, something which, you know, is logical, measurable, uh, and as opposed to emotions and, let's say, beliefs that meant religious beliefs. Um, but as we probably all know from our histories, from China and outside, that rationalism, if taken to extreme in dogmatic way, can be utterly irrational and can turn into some sort of religion uh, which we saw particularly in China, for example, in late 50s until late 70s with Cultural Revolution, which was one of those radical uh, breaks from the past and um, uh, this, uh, let's say, break from the past, meaning, let's say, Confucianism is bad and it's useless. We should do the scientific you know, ways like casting the iron and modernize and industrialize speedily the country, which of course led to spectacular, devastating failures. Um, so uh, after this period, of course, in post 1980s, uh, in, in, in late 1970s and 1980s, there was a political reform, economic reform, and sort of um, revision of this, uh, of these approaches, while between late 50s and late 70s, for example, the ethnicity uh, or some cultural uh, uh, some cultural um, practices were out, even outlawed, banned. In the 80s, they returned. And this political and economic and this opening up, Kaige Kaifang reform opening up, of course, brought an unprecedented success. Uh, a lot of people were lifted out of poverty, but there was also trade-offs, as always. So. Uh, it also brought the continuous environmental destruction. Now, let's talk about uh, a little bit about the environmental protection together with science here in Chinese context. So the notion of eco ecology as other of these concepts were also imported in the 
this time early 20th century through Japan, Sheng Tai Xue, Sei Tai Gaku. Uh, but there was some confusion, co confusion uh, right from the beginning, uh, because it did not really stu study living organisms, but it studied lifeless world, meaning it didn't really study plants in their environment. Uh, you just uproot the plant, bring it to the laboratory, dry it, and categorize it. Okay, so there was this uh, different indigenous version of ecology in China, uh, which lasted quite long, and only sort of moved towards the environment environmentalism since the 1980s, uh, <clears throat> when following the Soviet Union and its own mention of ecological civilization, uh, China later also uh, developed its own concept of Sheng Tai Wenming or ecological civilization. Um, and this concept basically goes uh, the other way around with the big loop, uh, which China did in the last 100 to 150 years. So when, let's say, during the Cultural Revolution or during the new culture movement in 19, late 1910s, uh, there was this push for um, forgetting the Confucianism and its uh, central uh, place in the society. Uh, suddenly, with the ecological civilization and um, the Confucianism is very useful because it, uh, of course, uh, stipulates or it, it says that it uh, places uh, the human inside of nature, regulates this healthy balance between the nature and the people. And also from this point, you can draw ethical, spiritual, cosmological, and also cosmologic uh, and also political dimension. Because uh, with this ecological civilization, it's something recently which China brings into the global stage. China now becomes this driver of, let's say, um, environmental protection. Uh, but this environment, environmental protection goes different ways. Uh, so it includes protection and revitalization, but also uh, built up environment. So basically when during the industrialization, then the environment got destroyed. Now the person or the people must build it back to make it work again. But of course, by, by building it back, you creating something else. Uh, that's a good example here, this, this uh, sign, I took a picture in this huge natural park in Yangshan, Southwest Sichuan area. It says, Jia So to strengthen the buildup of the environment and to protect the environmental uh, security uh, in no man's land, basically. But uh, the truth is that the uh, forests in that area are, are all man-made. I'll talk about it a little bit later. And uh, since the, let's say 20 years ago, roughly 30, 20 years ago, uh, the China also, or the Chinese government started to at least uh, on paper value the so-called indigenous or local knowledge. Uh, well, this comes with the push from the United Nations who in, uh, I think it was 1992, they started to declare that people should pay more attention to so-called indigenous knowledges of the Amazon, uh, uh, indigenous people of Amazon, how they relate to their environment, how they live sustainably within their environment and don't really over excessively exploit it. Um, and this uh, actually brings us, a, this is just, this is the garden unification I'm talking about. This is the man-made Shen Tai, which you can see also in, in the Qinghai Lake in Liangshan. So uh, when we talk about the indigenous people or China doesn't have the context uh, or doesn't really recognize the concept of indigenous people because the government says all the people in China are indigenous, uh, including the Hanzu. Uh, so, there is not this dichotomy of colonizers and colonized. So uh, now let's talk a bit, uh, who are the E? So the E, uh, E people, this really broad exonym in Imperial China described mostly non-Han inhabitants 
of both highlands and lowlands across the Southwest China. So the E was really a generic term for this non-Han people. Uh, the E as we know it today as an ethnic category was starting to be built up during the Republic of China through the works of ethno-historians, anthropologists like Ma Changshu, Ma Xieliang and Lin Yaohua. All of them Han Chinese, uh, most of them studying uh, with people who either get their anthropological training abroad or uh, were students of somebody who did their anthropological research abroad. So uh, they tried to construct uh, these ethnicities in order to plug them into the something which was uh, to be a Chinese nation. Uh, during the PRC, actually, in um, in antithesis to ROC, where the key the, the 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 goal of the ROC was to assimilate really these people into one strong nation, because China, of course, was being attacked by the Western powers, and uh, the intellectuals stressed the fact that we need a strong nation in order to protect our territorial integrity and so on. So uh, the Southwest, so, so the ROC constituted of five ethnic blocs: Han. Uh, Tibetans, uh, Manju, Mongols, uh, and Hui, which was the generic term for Muslim population. But the people of the Southwest, including the Yi, did not really exist in this paradigm. So when the Kuomintang, the ROC leaders, lost their civil war with the Communist Party of China, the Communist Party of China actually kicked off. The one, one of the first things they actually did was to run this monstrous campaign which was probably the one of the biggest social engineering campaign in the history of humankind that within a very short time they needed to find those identities for those nationalities as an antithesis to this assimilation push of their uh, sworn enemies the, the Kuomintang so while the Kuomintang didn't want to recognize really the immense di diversity the communists on the first first you know first years came and say, no, we are a diverse nation and we will craft the identities for you in order that you have a voice and you have a political representation. So in this map, we can see the E, but this area is big like three Francis, basically. And therefore you can imagine that uh, there are over, there are dozens, probably close to hundred different E communities with their different way how they call themselves. So there's this huge inationality, which is bigger than Tibetans, for example, or even than Mongols, the more exposed and known uh, uh, nationalities. But uh, the E are uh, not really coherent, let's say. The E from Liangshan couldn't use their own language to uh, communicate with the E from Ailaoshan over here. Uh, their cultural experience is completely different. When, when I traveled across Guizhou, uh, Yunnan, and uh, and Sichuan, and I tried to like, sh you know, I shared some pictures and some concepts, cultural concepts of the different E with another E, they were looking at it and said, no, 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 that's not right. This is not E. We are the real E. And of course, wherever I came, uh, said, oh, we are the real E. Those other are fake. E. They are not E. That's pretending. Are listen to us. So. Uh, the mutual differences among the various e communities was always there because they were constructed from this very uh, very uh, differentiated pool of people and it persists until today so my research actually most of my research happens in this uh, place called Liangshan you can see that the concentration of the e in Liangshan is the highest and this this has really a this has really a reason because uh, that area is very, uh, or at least, uh, at least until recently, was very hard to access. Uh, so historically, a lot of these communities were running away either from their clan rivals or from the state or for whatever reason, uh, because of the local war. They, many of them actually found refuge in that place. Uh, for example, I'm not sure if you are familiar with the work of James Scott, which is called The Art of Not Being Governed. Uh, he talks about how the people from lowlands escape to the highlands in order to escape the bureaucratic state. 
uh, this doesn't really apply to the E much because E, as I said, are both lowland and organized polities and also highland people. So there was this immense, uh, uh, immense migrations and therefore also the history or the, these oral histories of the E are a genealogical accounts of endless migrations across environment. The Liangshan, therefore, because of this special place was perceived as remote and dangerous and impenetrable place. Uh, uh, Henri Vicom Dolon, uh, this uh, army officer French from the beginning of 20th century, even said that Liangshan is the last undiscovered place in the world. We get, went to the Papua New Guinea already. We went everywhere, but nobody ever went to Liangshan because who entered never came out. He was enslaved or killed or, or whatever. Um, so this place had no central rule. And it was at least for the last 250 years until the 1950s in perpetual interclan warfare. So there was no king. There was no Lama who would unite the place. They were just mutually competing clans who ra raided the lowlands, snatched you know, either Roland E or Han Chinese or any other ethnic cities, drag them to the mountains to be their slaves. Uh, and therefore, uh, not only that the E, this category is immensely diverse across the Southwest, the Liangshan itself is very diverse as well because of this. Uh, so the Nosui, this is their autonym. They call themselves Nosu, which means black people because they're, you know, they're, live high in the mountains and they are exposed to huge doses of sunlight so their skin is a little bit black that's maybe one uh, explanation the other one their traditional aristocracy is said to have black hard bones uh, so therefore they call themselves black people um, the nosu in this research scientific research were made central because of ideological conditions of Marxist uh, historical materialism, which tells you that the society or the societal uh, um, developments are based in history and you have these five periods from primitive society to slave society to feudal and capitalist and socialist society. So the Nosu among the all other E were designated because of their remoteness as, as the most ancient, most well-preserved ones. This is, of course, hugely problematic because, as I said, those different E cultures of this eosphere de de uh, develop differently across the Southwest. So it's really hard to say who are the authentic E. <clears throat> so, as I said, this uh, there was no social order, uh, very clan-based society, uh, but there was aristocracy who just intermarried between themselves and there was like 6% of them and there was 94 commoners or slaves. Uh, what happened in 1956, the Communist Party, of course, went to that place and toppled this whole hier hierarchy upside down. So they liberated the slaves. The slaves suddenly get the, uh, the former slave or enslaved people got these positions in, in as cadres in the government. And the former aristocracy were set out to toil on the land, you know, to experience the uh, hardships of the, of the life. So from this period, we are talking 50s, 60s, there was uh, a really, uh, you know, there was the beginning of the E stigma because they were seen as super backward, fierce, um, fierce uh, barbarians, really, who practiced this feudal superstition of Anki and Mishin. And this was also, of course, this view was this uh, radical and rationalism infused by uh, this Marxist, Marxism, Leninism, basically. Um, in 1980s, uh, with the relaxation, uh, there was the golden age for the E because there was a new emerging academic elite of indigenous E anthropologists who actually wrote about themselves. So it was not Han Chinese, it was not foreigners, it was not English or French missionaries. This was the first time that the E actually retrospectively looked and on themselves and just tried to sort of emphasize different uh, aspects of their society that they would destigmatize themselves um, but the stigma of course never comes away because until recently they were seen in, in other light as, as 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 drug users and hiv carriers 
due to their backwardness also, of course. In the center of this identity building was uh, a demo, this person here, who has the capability of read the e-script, which is a unique writing system, different from Chinese. And therefore he was made from this 1960s feudal superstition carrier into intellectual. So this is our intellectual, this is our script. We derive everything from those scriptures and from this person. So he became the main, let's say, protector and carrier of this new e-identity. Um, however, uh, since the 1980s until now, there are various issues uh, uh, still prevalent within uh, within within this, uh, let's say, nation building because you still have the uh, very rationalist and atheistic ideology on one hand, but then you have this uh, ethnic revival, if you can call it like that, uh, which makes use of the cultural elements, which recently call, uh, were called feudal superstition. Uh, so there was also a big debate how to actually construct the belief, the animistic belief of the E. Uh, should it be a religion? Some of the E intellectuals believe that if it will become official religion, uh, it will get more protection of the state, which is really deb debatable if we know how, especially, I don't know, Islam, Christianity is nowadays controversial in China. And I always told to friends uh, who were really ridiculous about it, just, you know, be more low key. Uh, if you really construct this as culture, it's much more, it's much more, um, you know, likely to um, achieve some sort of uh, political power. Of course, there is nowadays, for the last 20 years, this intangible heritage uh, search in China, which is not the Chinese product uh, itself. It's uh, indigenized from the UNESCO, which really cherry picks the elements of the Nosu or the, yeah, mainly the Nosu culture and project it on the all year of your Southwest, meaning they create this hierarchy of what counts as a good culture and what counts as a feudal superstition. So what we should keep and what we should go, uh, let go. Uh, recently, there is this Yifan Isu campaign. This is really uh, local to Liangshan, which is really about this meaning Yifan to change the style or to change some appearance. And Isu means to simplify the customs, meaning you should not uh, spend so much money for funerals and weddings. Don't be so wasteful and lavish. Uh, eat less. It may be Chinese food. Don't 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 slaughter the so many pigs and cows for your feasts and sacrifices. Um, so this actually brings a fundamental question. We have this local knowledge which should be used in environmental protection, and at the same time, some of this local knowledge simultaneously is branded as feudal superstition. Um, and this really nice uh, connects to what Igor presented here about the locality and the people. Uh, Liangshan Prefecture has 19 counties in total. They are topographically, climatically, and politically very different from each other. What does it mean? Some of these places are covered with forest. Some of these places are bare. Some of these places are more lowland. Some of them more highland. Uh, the political side of it in one county may be this ritualist um, culture or whatever uh, we can or we want to call it is seen as culture. Somewhere else in another county is seen as primitive religion. Uh, in some other county, they construct it as art or like, you know, means we issue, uh, nationalities art. And in particular, Qinyang County wants to be very, uh, let's say, uh, rationalistic, so they construct it as feudal superstition. So you have all these narratives existing in this small place at the same time. Here on this sign, you have uh, Di Zhefeng Tian Mi Xian, Ho Chu Chuan Tong Lo Xi, Shu Li Wen Ming Xin Feng, which means basically uh, crack or like suppress the feudal superstition, uh, get rid away of this uh, traditional bad habits, and establish a new customs. So it is really difficult 
nowadays to reconcile this contradiction between ideology and practical needs. Uh, but this local knowledge uh, connected to envir environmentalism is, might be potentially a new vehicle for preservation of the local practices if you actually sell it to the ideology in the right way. Uh, <clears throat> now let's let's have a look on some of these environmental challenges in Langsha. Uh, there are many, of course, because uh, in the last two decades, uh, Liangshan experienced an unprecedented boom and got um, gradually connected to this larger China, let's say, it's meaning new, new roads were built, new airports were built, uh, high-speed railways, and so on. I'll talk about it later. But uh, one of the first uh, environmental challenges is mining. This is what you see here is Mana. Uh, it's Aget particular Liangshan I get very uh, very famous one and 10 years ago the Liangshan was covered by the illegal black mines uh, there were a lot of casualties among the miners of course because there were no safety standards until the local government heavily cracked down on this issue another very big uh, uh, environmental challenge as I said already before is the gradual deforestation uh, which actually already happened during the empire, meaning Ming, Qing dynasty, then continued through the ROC, through the commercial logging. Uh, Igor was talking about this warlord, uh, Li Wanghui. Uh, one of his family members actually established a profitable business in Liangshan when he, on the land he controlled, he prohibited the traditional Nosui way of bu burial, cremation, and he stipulated that they will be buried down in the coffins. Therefore, he had the company who made coffins. And uh, so he was actually mining the, the forest for the coffins uh, in order to sell it to, uh, to, the, to the people who, who were about to be buried. And during the PRC, actually gradually, slowly, this problem started to be tackled. Um, here we can see the very notable difference. This is me in this man-made forest, Zhengongli. This is 20 odd years old forest, uh, which is monocultural largely and made, made of pine, pine trees. Uh, very different from the original Yuan Shenzhen, the uh, jungle or original forest. Uh, therefore, this, of course, uh, helps in some way, in uh, this carbon sequestration and uh, and so on, but uh, it also there's a trade-off because if you in this forest, if you throw a cigarette butt, well, maybe something will flare up if if it's dry enough, but it will eventually stop because it's so dense and humid that this wouldn't this is unlikely to break into huge uh, fire. If you in the summer throw something like this in this forest, it will burn like immediately. Um, so this deforestation is actually visible all over Liangshan. All, also, that you see these kind of forests are not really native to Southwest China. So you see my friend here standing in one of those patches of this original forest. Here is Here used to be an original forest. These stumps are probably maybe 50, 60 plus years old. Those were very high quality wood, which probably end up maybe even abroad. Um, so also the Nosui uh, were engaging in uh, um, unscientific Sweden agriculture. But again, uh, the Sweden agriculture doesn't have to be really unscientific. It depends on how many people you have to do it and what kind of forest or what kind of environment you do it. So if you burn a patch of original forest, you actually plant your crops, then leave it fallow for another five years. The forest actually can recuperate it from that and it's even beneficial to the forest. But if you want to do something like this here, then of course you will damage the whole forest. It will just burn all the way down. So uh, the commercial logging was also uh, cracked down on in 1990s. And it must be also, uh, must be uh, pointed out that this, um, contention over forests 
uh, are very deeply historical in Liangshan because as I will talk a little bit later in the last 10 minutes, um, there are patches of forest which are sacred for Nosu, which they didn't enter and sh nobody should enter them, especially like in the video in Charung Zanzu, there was also somebody talked about it, like forest, don't, we all can make a So the, the, so the Nosu has the same, actually very similar con concepts to Charung Zanzu because they live in similar environment. Um, so uh, another, of course, trade-off uh, of this rapid development is the environmental impact of, uh, of, of, of the development of highways and high-speed railways and uh, energetical infrastructure, mm -hmm. meaning hydropower and especially wind farms and solar energy. And also uh, uh, the monocultural cash crop introduction in different counties. Now different counties have this you know, the, the, this main leading product. So in Yenyuan County, you have apples. In Labo County, you have oranges. In uh, another Huidong County, you have a fig uh, and so on. So this infrastructure actually started to penetrate deeply into the Nosuri society. You see some traditional festivities. This is the fire, summer fire festival. Uh, it's all, uh, if, you, if you go in Weixin, if I swipe around this time through the wasting of my friends, everybody just put, you know, the wind farms are literally everywhere right now. Uh, there are also some very layered kind of things. So you have you have a valley uh, in, near Sichang, which goes north-south direction between Chengdu and Kunmi, runs to the prefecture capital. Here you have the wind farm, here you have the cash crop. The the, the, the the grapes yeah uh, and especially also in this uh, in this uh, in this what is it what is it called Pan, panze. Uh, like like a tent uh, you really plant everything you could be planting so you have the grapes up you have potatoes down. So this is all very layered. Then you have a lot of uh, solar energy farms, uh, which actually are uh, merging with pastoralism uh, and so on. Now, uh, this of course, uh, all this development brings some unforeseen disasters as I, as I was talking about. This is a huge fire of over Sichang, over the lake, which you just saw in the different slide. Uh, this was also, monocultural forest, which just burned down in three days and close to 15 or even 35 firefighters actually died during mitigating that fire. Uh, something similar happened in Muli County in Tibetan County before also it claimed life of 32 firefighters. Um, so these are actually blamed, scientifically explained that, uh, you know, it's all people's fault uh, that they shouldn't uh, you know, smoke in the mountains, uh, and so on. But, uh, you know, you can actually argue that this happens because of you brought the people outside of the mountains who actually manage this forest, these traditional communities, and about the change of the nature of the forest. So, um, by trying to mitigate or to construct this environment, you actually get rather trade-offs than solutions. Um, now even AI is applied to actually monitor the forest if somebody is not starting some fire. Now, Nosui has this, uh, their own traditional way, this local knowledge way, how to mitigate disasters. What does it mean disaster in the Nosui context? Of course, the disasters are caused by malicious ghosts. That means diseases like leprosy, one of the worst imaginable things. This is actually very rare ritual against leprosy. You can see that one once in a few years because Leprosy is not so prevalent anymore. Uh, the person who actually ordered this ritual didn't have a rep leprosy. He just had some rash and he feared it's leprosy. So he called uh, two of these BMO to uh, help him out with this uh, problem through the mediation, of course, between the ancestral spirits. So, so the BMO evokes ancestral spirits to come and battle the ghosts away. Um, 
The same goes with the environment. So um, landslides, for example, uh, are thought or were thought in the past because, because you breached the sacred forest, meaning you went to the forest. It has a logical rationalist explanation. You go to the forest, you cut down the trees. Of course, the erosion comes and mountain falls on your village. So there is this... Uh, Okay, the Bimo has thousands of rituals, but they are all, there, there is this pool of rituals which deal with um, with the mountain worship, uh, or it has different subsections like Rida, uh, which is uh, against the falling stones, Rida against the falling water, or Zitpo, which is against the hailstorm. Uh, this is to say, and we actually saw it today, this is not really unique to Nosu, caring about the forest. Uh, you can see it among the Dai people in Sichuan Bana. You can see it among all the Tibetans of Western Sichuan, be it Ursu Tibetans and Jarung Tibetans. You see it among Prami people of Muli and Yunnan and so on. And you actually see it also with, among the Chinese Han minority through the Feng Shui, Feng Shui forest, which has very similar function. Um, so really quickly, I just, these are three stories I encountered along the way, along one way during my recent field work. And this is the first one is uh, actually connected to the title of my speech. So we went to this uh, relative of my, uh, uh, my, my colleague who is Nosu, uh, one of her, I don't know, 75 uncles because Nosu, we are always really huge clans and families. And we wanted to know uh, what's going on in their village because there was a large infrastructure project of a highway going through it. And of course, uh, and, and also the place notoriously suffered through um, erosion and landslides. Um, so we were uh, invited for this pig slaughter and we were waiting for the pig to be made. And then we were eating the chunks of meat of the pig. And we started to talk and um, we asked, so do you do these rituals here still? And the young people said, no, not anymore. We, we just don't do that. And one of the old people, one of the elderly person, 70 plus years old, uh, said, you know, the people, uh, when they build the highway, they use this jadan, you know, they use these bombs to, you know, go through the mountain and just blast the rocks. It scared the spirits and ghosts away. They are not coming back. Plus, they already entered the forests and they left their garbage there. So the forest, they are gone. Eating pulling, pulling. Huh? So, you know, we just follow the science and not this belief anymore. Um, so that was his kind of view of the situation. Only a couple of days later, of course, I we ended up in the county town and visited another uh, good acquaintance of my colleague. And he told us the story that there was this family who were immensely rich by this black mining of the mana of this agate. And then the landslide came and that was the only house in the village that was swept away and everybody died in one night. The, 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 the landslide went through the village, didn't touch the other houses. So there is this recurring notion of science. So, so the people basically oscillate. When nothing happens, they say, okay, we don't believe this thing. But when something actually really happens, the first thing they do, they call the Pimo to do something, some, some rituals for them. Um, and the third story happened again three days later. Uh, uh, and it was with my good friend, which I'm, I haven't seen for a while. And I uh, asked him about whether in his place, which is a Sida county, it's close to Sichang, the, the administrative capital, if they do these kind of rituals. And he said, yeah, we used to do that. You know, we, and as I said, the rituals really differ, differ according to the environment. The use of the plants differ, the use of the animals differs as well. And he said, yeah, we usually do this, that we bring this meal into the mountains. We sacrifice a dog, uh, you know, and uh, we invite our Bimo to go into the mountains and read the scriptures uh, to appease the mountain. And we make the contract with the forest and the mountain that nothing will happen the next year. But then actually the scientists came to our village and said, you are actually doing this, by doing this, you are attracting the hailstorm because of the heat you emanate from your bodies when you chant and run around the mountains. And when you chant, there's this vibration, you know, which goes into the mountains and then makes the 
landslide. And said, and so they introduced us another thing how to mitigate the hailstorm. They got they got is this hailstorm cannon, which you actually you come the cloud coming, you just fire something into the air, some synthetic, and basically disperse the cloud. So funny thing was that the BIMO lost his purpose in this village, but another person who was the only one who can operate this kind of machine gained another fame and reputation. So he was the only one who um uh, who was able to blast those things. But one day he was not present in the village. The villagers saw the cloud coming. And so somebody else tried to blast it and he blasted his head off. And therefore they have to call the BIMO back in order to do rituals, not to happen this again. So you can see how these things really interrelate. Um, so I'm at the end of the talk. And uh, just a few open-ended questions, which might be also something you might want to ask, or you have maybe more. In Liangshan, what does the science mean, actually? And is it elusive or compatible with the local knowledge? Because in Tibetan areas like Qinghai or Dezhi in Yunnan, it's been 20, 30 years that this local knowledge was really implemented in the policies, but not in Liangshan. Why? Uh, this is probably something that we have to find out. Uh, what's the value of the local knowledge in Liangshan? Uh, you know, for me, or at least from what I see, this local, this local knowledge or these rituals are really bound to the immediate environment in one's village. It's not the ethnicity or anything. It's bound to the topography or orientation of the village, which is something very similar to what uh, uh, you were talking about. Uh, with this spatial, uh, sp uh, spatial uh, coordinates, which are different in different places. So I, my question also to you would be how this relates to animist practices or these semi-religious practices, how it's reflected in there. How this can coexist with the rationalist and largely atheistic uh, ideology uh, that needs definitely a lot of creativity. Uh, are the scientific over-rationalist visions, you know, this is a feudal superstition, get rid of it. Really, uh, does it override the knowledge? And when encountering this scientific outlook, like, is there a way back to the local knowledge? Because this is the biggest problem right now. Uh, the people start to pay attention to the local knowledge of Yangshan, but a lot of people say, oh, we don't need it anymore. We don't do it. We don't do the rituals. So you want to obtain the local local knowledge, but many people just, you know, let it go. So is there something to obtain? So thank you very much for your attention. I was just a little bit of shameless promotion. This is uh, our project uh, web page. We all, everything we write is ethnographies, so it might be readable for everybody, hopefully. Hopefully also interesting, it's all open access. So hopefully also in the following years, they will be growing um, a number of articles that can answer at least some of these questions. Thank you.